And let's begin our service by singing in Psalm 121. <clears throat> Psalm 121. The familiar words, I to the hills will lift mine eyes, from whence doth come my aid. My safety cometh from the Lord, who heaven and earth hath made. Thy foot he'll not let slide, nor will he slumber that he keeps. Behold, he that keeps Israel, he slumbers not nor sleeps. The Lord thee keeps, the Lord thy shade, on thy right hand doth stay. The moon by night thee shall not smite, nor yet the sun by day. The Lord shall keep thy soul, he shall preserve thee from all ill. Henceforth I go now to noon, God keep, forever will. These words, Psalm 121, I to the hills. <clears throat> I to the hills will live. Now come together in prayer. Let's all pray. <clears throat> Again, our Lord and our God, we would gather ourselves in thy presence to praise and to worship thy name. And especially on this, the significance of a step across one year into the next. To look back and to remember the ways in which thou hast been good unto us. Favouring us, prospering us, keeping us, providing for us. And may we be able to search through all of these details of past days, that they may be added to the fire of our worship and our praise at this time. For indeed, we have a great debt unto thee, not only for the ordinary and common blessings each and every day, but especially, Lord, for the spiritual blessings given to us in Jesus Christ, thy Son, whereby we have pardon and forgiveness. We have peace and rest and quietness in our soul. 
we're able to face all that life might throw at us, depending upon and drawing on thy resource. And the ultimate experience and event of life itself has neither fear nor terror for thy people, for thou art the victor over sin and over death. And so there is the rightful experience given to thy people. Peace and rest this day. And as we gather all of these experiences together and face the year that is now in prospect before us, we speak with our soul and we take thy word in our conversation that thou art the one who changeth not. And so, Lord, may we step out whatever this year may hold for us, depending upon and drawing upon thyself with the expectation <clears throat> not just simply of the past blessings be multiplied to us, but, Lord, in thy grace, so often thou dost exaggerate them, multiply them. Out of the provision of thy hand thou dost give lavishly unto the needs of thy people. So come in with us, Lord, as we would renew our vows this day. Come in with us, Lord, <clears throat> and speak to us through thy word. May it come with power and with might to our soul, not as the word of man, but as it truly is, the word from heaven of the living and the true God. We pray thy blessing then upon ourselves, individually alone and apart, and all of the problems we have and the burdens we carry. We remember our own family circle, and we ask for that same blessing to be experienced and had by them as we want for ourselves. And as we extend out yet further the scope of our prayers, to our communities, to our nation, and to our people. We ask, Lord, that thou would be mindful of us. Work amongst us in thy wisdom as is fit and appropriate to our need. And we pray, Lord, that we might know what it is, as a nation and as a people, whatever might arise in this year to come, to look to thee self for wisdom and for counsel. The words of man are so inadequate, so often, to meet the needs that we have to face. May we again as a people turn to thyself and know that lavish provision, that abundance of wise counsel to every need that might arise. Come in with us then. Grant thy blessing upon thy word as we would read it and meditate upon it this morning. And in all of thy dealings with us, deal with us, Lord, in thy grace. And pardon us our sin, for we ask it in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. A <laughs> reading this morning is from the Old Testament, and I'm going back into the book of Second Chronicles. Not a place we often go to, but I'll give you some time just to find it. Samuel, Kings, and then Chronicles. Second Chronicles chapter 20. And we're going to read verses 1 through 19 of that chapter. Second Chronicles chapter 20 then, from the beginning. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon, and with them others beside the Ammonites, came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Then there came some that told Jehoshua, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be in Hazan Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court and said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might so that none is able to withstand thee? Are not thou our God, who didst drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people Israel, and gavest it to the seed of Abraham thy friend forever? 
and they dwell therein. And have built thee a sanctuary then for thy name, saying, If when evil cometh upon us as the sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, we stand before this house and in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, then thou wilt hear and help. And now, behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldst not let Israel invade, when they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. O Lord our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us, neither know we what to do. But our eyes are upon thee. And all Judah stood there, before the Lord, with our little ones, their wives, and their children. And then upon Jehazel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the Spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation, and he said, Hearken ye, all Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem, and thou, King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto thee, be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Tomorrow, go down ye against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Sis, and ye shall find them in the end of the brook, before the wilderness of Jezreel. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves, stand ye still, and see the salvation of the Lord with you, Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow, go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. Amen, and may God add his blessing, granting to us understanding, reading of his word. Let's continue our worship this coming time coming to Psalm 77. Psalm 77, and we're singing from verse 5. Psalm 77 from 5 through to 10. The days of old I called to mind, and often think upon the times and ages that have passed full many years ago. By night my song I call to mind and commune with my heart. My spirit did carefully inquire how I might ease my smile. Forever will the Lord cast off and gracious be no more. Forever is his mercy gone, fails his word evermore. Is it true that to be gracious the Lord forgotten hath and that his tender mercies he has shut up in his wrath? Then did I say that surely this is mine infirmity. I'll mind the years of the right hand of him that is most high. 77, 5 through 10, 5 stanzas, the days of old to mind I called. The days of old.
For our meditation this morning, I'd like to turn to the book of Psalms this time, to the book of Psalms and to Psalm 46. It is but 11 verses, so let's read it before we come to study it. Psalm 46. God is a refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, though the mountains be carried into the midst of the seas, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Selah. There is a river, the streams whereof shall make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacles of the Most High. God is in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. God shall help her, and that right early. The heathen raged, the kingdoms were moved. He uttered his voice, the earth melted. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge, Selah. Come. Behold the works of the Lord, what desolations he hath made in the earth. He maketh wars to cease unto the end of the earth. He breaketh the bow and cutteth the spear in sunder. He burneth the chariot in the fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the heathen. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our refuge. I want to take just but two words out of verse 10 for a meditation we carry with us into the new year. It simply is this, be still. And I want to introduce it in a very personal way because I want to think we're on New Year's Day and I want to go back to a New Year's Day over a hundred years ago. Something had happened in Stornoway. The Great War had just ended. There was relief and thankfulness that so many had survived alive and were going home. Many of them were from the RNR, the Royal Navy Reserve. They had been in dangerous waters. They had fought hard battles. And on Tuesday, the 31st of December, 1919, 283 active serving personnel were gathered on the quayside in Kyle, longing to get home to Lewis for the new year. They were looking for the first boat home, and there were two boats there. One was the Sheila, and the other was the Iolea. On the island, there was so much preparation taking place because the family were getting ready for people coming home. The houses were cleaned. Clothes were laid out. Food was made ready and prepared. Lights were burning late because there was an expectancy over the whole of the island and villages and houses. So much activity and so much talk. A father was coming home. A husband. A son. A brother. And so at midnight, the Isle Air sailed from Stornoway, from Kyle. Half past two in the morning, it was approaching the entrance to Stornoway Harbour. For reasons yet unknown, it overshot the entrance, turned too late, and hit the rocks. They were only 20 feet from the shore. But it was dark, and there was a big swell, and rough water was running. And of that 283, over 200 were lost that morning. Some of them were washed up at the foot of their own crofts on the Wednesday morning. In the days that followed, there were many families that were utterly broken and shattered, making their way into Stornoway to collect the remains of a loved one. Pain and sorrow was abroad deeply felt throughout the whole of the island. There was not a home, there was not a family that were not affected in one way or another. And they never talked about it. They never talked about it for years, such was the deep impress of that event on the whole of the island. It was put into the back of the memory, and only in relatively recent years has there been a memorial at all put up about the island. 
And in Stormy Free Church, there was the minister, the Reverend Kenneth Cameron. He had a hard time that time. He was the minister. What was he going to preach on? There was so much hurt and so much pain. As we said, every home was affected. How could he, as a minister, enter into the pain that so many were going through? All that he could do, all that he did do, was take this verse as a segment, as a text, on the Sunday following the loss of the Aguilera. Be still and know that I am God. We don't know what 2024 holds for us. It may, it hopefully is not as extreme as what I've just painted. But there will be times when we might be walking the same path at least. We, none of us are free from some kind of trauma or troubles in this year. We all have to drink in some measure from that same cup. So what can we best do as we set off into 2024? best we can do is listen to what this psalm says and hold it tight to our soul and when the, new, when the appropriate time comes upon us to dig back in our memory to what is said here today from this psalm to help us in our time of need. So then, let's break up the psalm very simply and briefly. First of all, I want us to think of the confidence in God which this psalm breeds. It does indeed take a cool nerve. It takes a strong faith to stop, to stand still, and to start thinking when trouble comes knocking on your door. We often feel we've got to do something. But here we're told, stand still. We read there in Second Chronicles, go back and read it again, and you'll find that <clears throat> this was not a quick and small skirmish that was being talked about there. There was, we're told, four times in that chapter we read, the Ammonites were a vast army, a great multitude were coming against Israel. Fear was spread. And what were they to do? Jehoshaphat, he gave the lead. They went and they prayed. They went and they spoke to the Lord. They went and they spoke to the Lord about their problem, about their need. But when you come to Psalm 46, not only is the psalmist speaking to the Lord, he's doing something more than that. He's speaking about the Lord. He's lifting his gaze above the circumstances in which he's placed. And he's talking about God himself. And he does two simple things for us, which we can do ourselves. First of all, he gives us a description of the Lord. And then he gives us a deduction from that description. His confidence in the Lord. God is what? God is a refuge and a strength. That's his relationship with his people. And we find so often in our Bibles that the revelation that God gives and makes of himself is not exhaustive. It is selective. The way in which God makes himself known is appropriate to the need his people are going through at that time. And so it is here. And so it was in Stornoway in 1990. God is a refuge and our strength. The troubles we go through so often highlight the character of the God we have. So he's a refuge in the midst of the chaos, in the midst of the pain and the hurt and the anguish. When an enemy is pursuing or circumstances go against us or providences bring fearful things to knock on our door of life. When we're exposed to such experiences, the best that we can do 
follow the psalmist in his description of his God, our God. God is a refuge, but he is also our strength. He is a safe retreat for us. The storms would come. <clears throat> That's the circumstances of the isle in coming into the harbour. The storms are going to come beating on our door this year to come. But God will never leave nor abandon us. He is there a refuge. He is there a strength. Not only that, the psalmist goes on and he says, yes, he is a very present help. A very present help in trouble. <clears throat> this is a consistent quality about our God. We all do it again. We've done it last night. We might do it further this day. We look back and we review the year we've come through. We look back at other situations we've been in. Where there's been distress, trial, testing, weakness, frailty. Whatever the diary of life shows up for us. But in that diary of life we ask the question. How did God fare? How did God fare when all these multitude of experiences came upon us? And the one conclusion we have consistently is this one. He is a well-proven help in time of need. We have never lacked and he has never been late in ministry to us. There has always been that perfect timing, not according to our logic, but according to his perfect way of dealing with us. A very present help in time of trouble. So there we have it. First of all, the description. God is a refuge and our strength. God is our help. God is a well-proven help in time of trouble. So therefore, having talked about the description of God, what does the psalmist go on to do then? God is a refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, there's a logic to the Christian faith. Therefore, will not we fear? We are not going to be afraid. We are not going to be driven in a corner and look over our shoulder at everything that comes our way and speaks us. We are not going to be blind to the greatness of our God and only be intimidated by what man throws or providence brings. No. We have a deduction given to us here. We do not, we will not be afraid. Fear can indeed infect us, spoil us, ruin our life, ruin our days. But here we're told what we best counts of us. God is a refuge. We will not fear. And he goes on to speak about, though the earth be removed. Only yesterday and today we've heard of that tremendous earthquake in Japan and the tsunamis that are landing on the shores of Japan. You think of things that are immense, great, mighty. You think of the symbols, the world, the mountains round about us, the sea with all of its power. These are the things that the psalmist imports into his thinking. And he says, yes, they're mighty, they're stable, they're strong, they're there. But our God is even bigger and mightier and more powerful than these things. Our God, no matter how dramatic the things that visit us in life, our God does not move and does not change. There might be catalyst, there might be catalytic events come into our life in this year. Finance, health, spiritual. Our life can be shaken to the core in the days of this year. But the conclusion that the psalmist brings Fear not. Fear not. If God has dealt with the biggest problem we've got, that of our sin in sending his son to die on the cross, if God has dealt with the biggest problem we ever have, then we've got the right and the expectation and the hope 
that he will deal with all lesser ones also. This is our God. The description. The deduction. Our confidence in our God. So what else does the psalmist tell us? Not only the confidence in God, he goes on to talk about the commitment God has made. Let's follow the logic through. The same psalm. Verse 4, he says, there is a river. What's the commitment that God has made we can take out of these few verses? He first of all says, there is an abundance of supply. The river who makes his people glad. In these olden days, you'd have big walls round cities and they would always have plenty of food inside these walls to keep them going. But there was always a weakness which they were aware of and had to protect against. Where were they going to get their water from? Because water left them vulnerable. You can do without food for many a day, but you can do without water only for a few days. Water is the important requirement. And if you wanted to capture a city in these days, you never fought against the walls. You never went up against the stones, the bricks and the gate. You always went looking, where's the water? And you poisoned the water and you captured the city. And what we're told here is that an abundant supply of water for God's people. No matter what might be happening to you or to me, no matter what might be going on round about is involving us, there is always a supply, an abundance of supply to meet our every spiritual need. We might indeed be boxed in, but we're not shut out. There is an abundance of supply. Extreme might be the pressure, but secure is the supply that God gives and makes for his people. So we have the first thing, the commitment of God, the abundance of supply. But then we goes on, not only is there here the commitment of God, the abundance of supply, he goes on in verse 5, he says, there is an almighty keeper, God in the midst of her, she shall not be moved. There are signs, there are things that come upon us that rock us to the core. There are things that happen to us that leave us utterly speechless. There are times when we're knocked over. But there, there's this text telling us, in all of that extremity, God is in the midst of his people and with his people, and they shall not be moved. In the Old Testament, there was the Ark of God. And there was overshadowing the ark of God, the Shekinah glory of God. And when God was with his people, then his people were unbeatable. Why? They were unbeatable simply because God was indestructible. As long as he was with his people, they were safe. <clears throat> there might be so many ranging about them and against them. But they were safe and secure. There was a storm came upon the disciples when they were out in the boat. There was green water coming over them and they were really afraid. But God, Jesus Christ comes to them and says, I am with you, be not afraid. He is with his people. And the legitimate conclusion that we can draw, as we've done already, we are not afraid. He is our almighty keeper. He has an abundance of supply. The third thing we're told of the commitment, we are told here that God is our assured helper. Go to the words at the very end of verse 5. He, she, God shall help her and that right early. It's a quaint expression, right early. What it means is, at the dawning of the morning, God will be there to help. He's no idle spectator. He is no onlooker only to the woes and throes of God's people. 
when danger threatens, plain and simply, God is there to help us. And the timing of his coming onto the battlefield of life for you and me is set out for us here. When troubles first appear, in the very morning of that day, we're told God will be there right early. Right early. We've said God is never lacking, but also God is never late. Backs might be against the wall. Dire straits might be around us. All of us who live a godly life, we know what that means in the troubles and the tr problems that come our way, the opposition from people round about us. But we can also look above to our God as we flick through these pages of our diaries once again. And we can see similar circumstances arising in the past when we have been in a tight corner. And we can draw upon what happened to us then. We can read what God did. He was there right early, right on the mark, right at the time when we needed him most there to help us. At the point of our need, God steps in. God stops. God protects. God provides. Whatever be the appropriate way of ministering to help us, that is what the Lord does exactly when needed. So there we have, yes, the commitment of God, the abundance of supply, a river, the Almighty Keeper, the Assured Helper. The third thing I want to take of this psalm before we close, the comfort to our soul. Look at the last verse. The Lord of hosts is with us. What does that mean? We've got it in verse 7. The Lord of hosts is with us again. Why is that description given there for us twice? Well, in 1 Samuel, there was a thought rising in God's people. <clears throat> we want to be like the nations next door. We want to be like the other nations round about us. We want a king. And here is the Lord answering that. Yes, they wanted an earthly king. Just to be like other nations. But now God is saying, you're going to have a king. But a king that is so different from the kings of other nations. The one description that is given here, the Lord of hosts, what it means and what it brings out is, he is the powerful, almighty one. The one who rules in the heavens. The one who guides providences. The one who gives orders to angels. Here is the one who has that domain, authority and power. Far above any earthly king that you see round about you. He is going to be your king. The Lord of hosts. So, whatever might come against you, like the, like the Moabites in Second Chronicles that we read, whoever is going to come against you, mighty as they might be, they are no match for the Lord of hosts who is with you. They might be large in number, skilled in experience. They might have all the equipment that is necessary for a battle. But what's that compared to our God? The Lord of hosts is with us. Our comfort given in this psalm. But not only do we have the comfort of the Lord of hosts, we're also told the God of Jacob is your refuge. Now, why is that brought in here? Again, there's a significance in all the terms that are given of God's revelation with his people. Yes, we've seen it 
the Lord of hosts, a king fighting. But the God of Jacob? What is that for? Simply like this. Everything we've been saying so far out of this psalm is a great comfort. It's a great blessing. It's tremendous encouragement to the believer and to God's people then and to God's people now. But, but can all of these things be mine? I can look back on my life and you can and yours and there are so many things that would disqualify us. <coughs> We're so inconsistent in our life and living. We've let the Lord down in so many different ways that would disqualify us from any of these comforts being legitimately taken to ourselves. And what the Lord is doing here is addressing that very sentiment. He's addressing that very thinking. And he is drawing us back to the fickleness of Jacob. Jacob was a devious man. Jacob was inconsistent in the way he lived. There was much in Jacob's life was great disappointment to others and to the Lord. There are so many downsides to Jacob and his life and living and serving the Lord. But what God is saying here is that God was faithful to a man, even a man like that, in his covenant promises and commitment that he's given. And if God dealt with Jacob like that, God will deal with you and me in the same way if we're one of his and believe and trust in him. It is the pleasure of our God in his grace to deal with the unworthy. He is the one who is a refuge and we've got no basis to look for that to happen or to be our experience. So often we are very reluctant. We are so reluctant to take these things to ourselves. That's why, as I said, verse 7, verse 11, it's repeated for us. The Lord of hosts, this magnificent, almighty picture and revelation of God who's on our side. We draw back and we say, oh, that can't be for me. And God is saying it, yes, in verse 7. And just in case we let it go by us. And just in case we don't want to take it to ourselves. Before he closes off this psalm, God repeats it again. The Lord of hosts is with us. Nobody can touch us without the permission of God. Go back and read the book of Job. And the councils that took place in the heavens before anything came to visit Job in his life. There is nothing happening but without the permission of our God. Without his grace. Without his wisdom. Without his intervention. So therefore, I'm closing. We're not a cowering, we're not a rattled people. We're not a people that are going along in a fragile life. We're not looking over our shoulder at what happens next and what's going to come our way. We've got to keep on talking with our soul. And sometimes talking to yourself is not a healthy thing to do, but here we can see it is. We can talk with our soul about the God who's there, the description, the deduction that we're legitimately allowed to take and to make. We can look around and see the way in which we know he has been our helper. He's provided for us. He's been there at the very point of our need. We can see the way in which he is our present Lord of hosts. And he is the God of Jacob with us. All of these gathered together form a huge pile to encourage us. To breed that simple sentiment. Fear not. We've done it in the past, we've looked back. We're doing it today, looking back. And the best that we can do as we go forward into 2024 is just the same as the psalmist does. Be still 
and know that I am your God. In the fearful experiences of the disaster of the Isle, loss of the Isle, over 200 lives lost in Lewis, Reverend Kenneth Cameron, all he could do was preach that from that text. Whatever 2024 holds for us, all that we can do likewise is to be still and to know that God is with us, even the God of Jacob. Let us pray. Our Lord and our gracious God, again we bless thy name for the appropriateness of thy word to meet us in our need. We can so often look upon ourselves as isolated, separate and apart, and nobody understands what we're going through or thinking. But thou dost know us, and thou dost minister to us appropriately and exactly. And even as this year unfolds from this day onwards, help us, Lord, to remember what thou hast given us now, come what may, in the days that follow. And may we always acknowledge to give thee the praise and the glory for the way in which thou dost deal with us. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. <coughs> We're going to close by singing Psalm 37 and at verse 3. Set thou thy trust upon the Lord, and be thou doing good. And so thou in the land shalt dwell, and verily have food. Delight thyself in God, he'll give thy heart desire to thee. Thy way to God commit, him trust to bring to pass shall he. And like unto the light he shall thy righteousness display, and he thy judgment shall bring forth like noontide of the day. And then verse 7. Rest in the Lord and patiently wait for him. Do not fret for him who prospering in his way success in sin doth get. Psalm 37, 3 through 7 Set thou thy trust upon the Lord. mercy and peace from God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit rest upon and abide with you all. Amen. <laughs>